Thank you for coming to this very special event to honor and celebrate the new publication of Eco Art in Action with contributors and editors. Welcome to all of you zooming in from Pennsylvania, the Bay Area and New Jersey and many other locations. I'm Mary White, one of the co-chairs of WEED, joined by co-chair Manush Zomorodinia, WEED Vice Chair Sharon Siskin, Secretary Christina Bertia, and WEED co-founder and magazine editor Susan Liebowitz-Steinman. Women Eco Artists Dialogue, started in 1996, is a volunteer-run collective of female-identified visual artists, writers, curators, art historians, researchers, scientists, and others interested in highlighting the intersection of art and ecological issues. We'll start with a land acknowledgement. And if you wish, please use the chat to add your own land acknowledgement and location. Weed's office sits on the territory of the Wichen, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chichonio speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the sovereign Verona, Verona tribe of Alameda County, near one of the largest shell mounds in the Bay Area. We recognize the Muwiwak Ohlone tribe who are campaigning to become federally recognized. The Association of Rameitu Shaloni, who are researching, revitalizing, and preserving Rameitu Shaloni history and culture, and the Confederated Villages of Lejean and Sokorate Land Trust, who are working to return native land back to indigenous stewardship. First, we'll have a little Zoom housekeeping. Please keep your audio muted during the presentation unless you're speaking. Uh, we will be recording this, we are recording this presentation. The host may mute you if there's extra noise. The presentation will go on approximately one hour, at which point we'll stop the first recording and start the second recording for questions and answers. If you have questions during the first part of the presentation, please put them in the chat and then we'll try to address them in the second part. Um, Weed's vision is to continue for another decade as our global network of women, activists, artists, curators, writers grows. This month, we're happy to announce that we're going to start the rebuilding of our 2012 website with new archival tools to refresh and improve the artist directory and membership interaction. So please give generously to support this vision, either by visiting the donate button on our website or sending a check. Now we will introduce one of the co-editors of EcoArt in Action, Amara Geffen, who <clears throat> will then introduce our speakers. Thank you. Okay. Um... So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, which will take me just a minute to navigate. Um, and so you can now see my screen. And Whoop, not what I wanted to do. Sorry, folks. <laughs> that was a little clumsy, but we're there. You should be able to see my um, cover screen. Um, the title of so I am one of um, four editors for the pro for this project, and I'm also a community-based um, and environmentally focused artist. I want to take a minute and introduce um, two of the other co-editors who are on the call, Anne Rosenthal and Aviva Romani. Aviva is an affiliate of the Institute of Arctic and Alpine Research at the University of Colorado in Boulder. She exhibits and publishes internationally. Her work, The Blue Trees Symphony, is an aspect of Gulf to Gulf, um, a piece from 2009 to the present. And she is, which is an 
New York Foundation of the Arts sponsored project on changing climate change policy with art. Um, and I'm delighted to have uh, Aviva with us. Aviva and Anne and I will be available to participate in the Q&A after our presenters finish. So I'd also like to uh, introduce Anne Rosenthal. Anne brings to communities over 30 years of experience as an artist, an educator, and a writer. Her work examines the intersections of nature and culture through timely issues, including climate change and biodiversity. She teaches through Osher Lifelong Learning Institute through the University of Pittsburgh, and she received her MFA from Carnegie Mellon. Um, and Chris Fremantle, who is our fourth um, co-editor, was unable to um, join us sadly today. So we will marshal on without him. Um, we have three presenters today, Vaughn Bell, Susan Honig, and Lorraine Leeson, and our Q&A will be moderated by uh, Susan Steinman. So um, what are we here to do? We're here as part of WEED's Art and Education series, where we want to talk a bit about the Eco Art in Action, a new book put together by members of the Eco Art Network, and then we will have short presentations from three of the presenters in the book uh, or contributors to the book. And um, uh, then we'll move into the Q&A. Now, all of us, uh, Anne, Aviva, myself, Vaughn, Susan, and Lorraine are also members of WEED. And there's a lot of crossover between the work of the EcoArt Network and WEED, although they are obviously distinct groups. So let me share a little bit about, um, about the uh, book. Um, the book is published by uh, New York University, well, I'm sorry, by <laughs> New Village Press. It's uh, New York University Press is helping to promote. And I wanna give a shout out to our publisher, Lynn Elizabeth, who is here with us today. Um, the book is, uh, the full title of the book is Eco Art in Action, Activities, Case Studies and Provocations for Classrooms and Communities. We consider the book to be a field guide to eco art practice. Um, and it, it is a, basically a ready to go vetted uh, collection of activities, case studies and provocations facilitating artistic environmental projects. Um, there is a discount code for the book. Um, if you go to New Village Press website or to the NYU Press website, you can use discount uh, the discount code WEED25, which I believe gets you 20% discount. 25%? 25% discount. Um, interestingly, we are in our second run of the book. We've had uh, our first run of printing was a smaller run for a wide variety of reasons, but we've sold close to 350 books to date. And of course, we're hoping we will be able to sell more books. Uh, we are in our second, or just about to start our second <laughs> uh, sales of our second um, uh, printing. Um, if I can find my cursor, I'll move along. So the book is a collaboration of the Echo Art Network. The Echo Art Network was established in 1999. Um, it is a loose affiliation of more than 200 invitational members from diverse nations and disciplinary backgrounds. We are all concerned with creative transdisciplinary approaches to sustainable futures via ecological art practices, projects, research, and initiatives. Um, you can visit our website at uh, ecoartnetwork, all one word, dot org. And our network has um, a nice feature uh, that uh, Anne and several other members put together um, that allows you to search and find the different artists in our membership. It also allows you to search 
by topic. So if you wanted to, you could put in the search bar water or forests or recycling or um, any any kind of you know performance practice, et cetera, and you will find a collection of artists will appear. So you can get to know the work of these folks through that mechanism, even if you don't know who we all are uh, within the network. Um, so the book exists in both a print version and in an ebook version. And actually, if I can, well, I'm not going to um, shift. I was going to try to show you the ebook, but here are snapshots of several pages. And I want to point out a few key features. First of all, there are three sections to the book, as the title suggests activities, case studies, and provocations. And in the ebook, you can navigate anything that is blue, you can navigate directly to it, which is a nice, uh, a very nice feature. Um, the activities are structured so that they really present themselves as very easily adapted curriculum, both for traditional educational environments and community group environments, watershed groups, environmental groups, et cetera. We have a rather extensive and comprehensive bibliography section. <clears throat> and we also have in the ebook um, an index, which is searchable. And it includes um, thematic um, uh, navigation as well. So if you peruse the index and you want to see which pieces are focused on activism, you will be able to see a listing of them and the page numbers and click on that and it will take you to them. Now, of course, in the printed book, these features are also um, evident. You just can't navigate them on the, on the internet. You just have to do it the old fashioned way, find the page number and go, go to it. But we felt that that was really important. We worked very hard to make this book um, user-friendly um, across a wide spectrum of possible audience members, from artists to scientists to elementary teachers to uh, watershed group organizers, et cetera. Um, the book really focuses on the question of what is echo art, what is echo art pedagogy, and what are the strategies and methodologies, if you will, that echo artists um, work with? Um, we, the four editors, we created this Venn diagram, which gives you a very simple but effective illustration of the three interconnecting fields of knowledge that come together within echo art practice. And so there's, there is a great deal of variation as everyone on this call I'm sure knows um, between how, how much in this part of the sphere you are or this part of the Venn diagram you are in your practice or this area or this. And this is really the sweet spot where all of these disciplines come into um, balance and focus. Um, our speakers today will be presenting, um, and I've taken a snapshot from the ebook of the front pages of each of, of their, their contributions. And you can see that we provide an indication of who the audience is, how many participants might be involved, how long it may take, and um, how long the project has taken, how long the activity might take, et cetera. And then the themes are listed. And I just realized, please forgive me, that I mentioned uh, there are three sections to the book, activities, case studies, and provocations. And I said a little bit about the activities being organized and presented in terms of their format and structure so that they are it should be very clear to people how to adapt this for whatever kind of a educational environment they're working with at whatever level. Um, the case studies also are adaptable. In fact, all of the 
um, three different types of pieces in the book are adaptable, but the case studies focus more on durational projects that our uh, eco artists within the book have undertaken over a series of years. And um, our presenters today, both are, uh, all three of them contribute from those first two categories. The provocations are intended to be a little bit more provocative in terms of overarching ideas um, within eco art. And so they are not, they do not attempt to lay out how you would adapt um, and carry that work forward into another, uh, into something that you're doing um, educationally. Um, for us, uh, the contributors to the book and for the four editors, we spent many, many hours discussing what is really our goal with this book. And it is to elevate eco art practice and to, um, celebrate those practices and to provide for emerging artists and artists on the path, perhaps new insights. It is the field guide that we wish we had when we were starting out. When, when all of us began more than 20 years ago, it was very difficult. The field was not defined and we were all kind of navigating our way through. Well, after more than 20 years, Eco art is, um, it may not get the attention in the art world um, that we would like it to get. Uh, there may be an, many people who are unaware of this work, but there certainly are multitudes of individuals through groups like WEED and the Net, Eco Art Network and also Eco Art Space. All of these groups were started at a very similar time, and there was a lot of overlap in who the founders of those groups were. So the field has expanded, there's greater awareness and there's obviously great urgency and need for these kinds of practices to help us um, find our way through um, the challenges that we face. Um, I also want to, before I introduce the speakers, I want to um, thank all of the contributors, um, New Village Press with great support from our publisher, Lynn Elizabeth, and the four editors um, working together. We ran a fundraiser campaign to help with community outreach at the College Art Association Conference and in many of these book talks that we have um, been doing to date. So with that, I want to, I will introduce the speakers as we move through. And Vaughn Bell, unfortunately, found out after we confirmed all the dates and deadlines, in fact, just two weeks ago, discovered that her, the, her son's school had scheduled his class commencement or graduation from middle, from elementary to middle school for right now. So she generously recorded a presentation uh, for us. Um, and I am hoping that I can figure out, I may have to stop my share folks. So bear with me if this is a little uneven, uh, I apologize, but I want to share Vaughn's um, uh, video as the next thing. So let me go back and find the share screen, make sure the right buttons are clicked. Okay, so Vaughn Bell is uh, based in Seattle, Washington. She is an artist who explores the paradoxes and possibilities of how humans relate to land, water, and other species. She creates public art projects, sculptures, um, installations, drawings, and performances, and teaches part-time also at the University of Washington, Tacoma. I actually first became aware of Vaughn's work more through her relationship with the Department of Seattle Department of Transportation 
and learned a great deal from the resources that um, she and other folks working with the DOT there put together. Much of my work has, many of my projects have focused on um, collaborating with the Department of Transportation. Anyway, so I'm pleased to share Vaughn's video. I'm gonna start it right now. Hi, I'm Vaughn. Thanks for joining today. And I'm sorry, I can't be with you synchronously. I'm going to share a few examples of the work I've been doing that's related to the EcoArt pedagogy that's outlined in the uh, EcoArt in Action book. And um, I'm going to start off with this project that involves some walking. And this relates to the exquisite map for site exploration project, which I included in the book, which is a tool for going out and exploring places in a way that's open ended community driven and encouraging of a creative mindset. I created this art project called the iPad, which you can see here in this picture. And it's related to this because it's about exploring sites and sharing that knowledge with others. The iPad is an analog tool for site exploration and it involves this walking stick, as you can see, with the little notebooks on it and people are invited to take them out and explore their environment. Now I've deployed these at galleries and museums as well as in classroom settings and basically distribute a group of them to a group of people. People take turns with them. They can take them out into the environment then bring them back to a central location and hand them off. There's prompts written on the notebook that provide entry points for people to explore their environment, uh, suggestions for ways to observe the environment in a multi-sensory way. Then when people come back to the space, they can share and they can then add to what others have put on the iPad booklet. So they get to see what other people have noticed in their environment. And by doing so, they're essentially sharing environmental knowledge in a very low key, tactile and physical way. At the end of a uh, period, some of the works have been then displayed in a gallery. So you can see here, some of these people went out for walks in the rain and then the um, notebooks were displayed in the gallery afterwards. Along the same lines of tactile and physical exploration, I've created a series of projects that involve uh, working with soil and clay. This first iteration of it happened uh, in collaboration with a group called the City Meditation Crew, who create performances related to contemplative practice in sites to call attention to environmental concerns. We collaborated for a project that's called Duwamish Revealed that involved many artists working on site with participatory and ephemeral work that related to the local conditions along the Duwamish River, which is a super fun site. The Duwamish Revealed project was organized by artists Sarah Cavage and Nicole Kistler. Here you can see city meditation crew workers wearing uh, their uniforms surrounded by participants who stop by and the activity is very simple. Gathering this clean sediment that's been gathered upstream from where this river is a super fun site and holding it and working with it with clay to create stone like objects. And this is a very tactile and process oriented activity and people are invited to engage with it in a contemplative manner, but they can also chat. Social interactions occur and it happens along the banks of the river or in community spaces that are inviting people to come together and become aware of their local environment. I found that people are very interested in the sort of um, the feeling of working with this and the way in which engaging with your hands allows your mind to work in a different way. We worked with schools and community groups, as well as in specific art spaces to create these works and uh, collectively thought of these activities as sort of being with the river activities. At the end of the, the making stage, People sometimes took these objects with them. Others, we took them and fired them in a kiln and gave the resulting river stones 
back to community members. This idea of tactile engagement with site has fascinated me for a long time. And I was able to do the same process uh, when I was invited to go to Italy and work with a historic hermitage from the medieval times in the mountains of Abruzzo. I was working with a group of students from the Academy Large Bella Aquila. And um, students gathered stones from this little stream that was at the base of a ravine. It involved walking down a path from the local village along this path that the medieval hermits would have taken uh, down to this stream. And then we worked together collaboratively, spending time together, simply being in this space and working with hands to make these larger stones out of lots of little stones. And then the larger stones, which have this wonderful tactile feeling that also includes the marks of hands on them, were then created, um, placed into cairns along the pathway. And over time, of course, they crack and dry because this is raw clay from the area. And then they melt away when the rain comes. And there you can see the medieval hermitage in the background. This was a wonderful opportunity to have art making be a process based participatory reflection on this physical space. And it was definitely a process for the students who were involved and of course for passersby who got to see these pieces. Um, that was another way that they could experience this work. Since then, I was invited to create a public art project at the University of Washington Tacoma campus as part of a commission for the Washington State Arts Commission. And there is a river there in the city of Tacoma called the Puyallup River. And my ongoing interest in rivers and waterways came to the fore in this project as well. Created these series of workshops with students and faculty and community members in which people could make stones with sediment from the Puyallup River which flows down from Tahoma, Mount Rainier. So it starts in glaciers and then goes downstream and eventually goes into the industrial basin, uh, which is highly altered by humans. At the same time, students were invited to create these worksheets, respond to these worksheets that ask them, what is the name of your river? And so students are from all over the place, um, faculty, community members as well, but mostly students participated in this and they, they would, they had the prompt to think about a river that is important in their memory. Maybe it's a place they grew up. Um, it could be anywhere in the world. And I did get river names from all over the world that people gave to this project. In the end, we took the river names from all of these rivers and made it into a perm includes 270 feet of river. And each river that I named that I was given, I looked up and saw it on a map. Um, this is a detailed image and you can see many of the rivers in this particular section are local to the Pacific Northwest where the work was done. But as you go upstream, the names reach further and further out geographical to space and that we have river names from all over the world. So this is an example of this action of uh, eco art teaching, eco art participatory making that's temporary and ephemeral becoming something that becomes a work of permanent public art. So just to share a few more things about my practice here, um, some of these projects were funded through grants. The City Meditation Crew collaboration received funding through Duwamish Revealed, which was funded through Art Place America. The um, iteration that was created in Italy was funded through L'Academy Bellarti L'Aquila. And then this project was uh, funded through a 1% for art project that was competitively selected through the Washington State Arts Commission. So finding a lot of different ways to manifest this kind of work. Thank you very much for um, joining me. Please feel free to reach out if you'd like to learn more or just chat or share ideas. And again, sorry, I can't be there synchronously with you today. I'm taking care of some family stuff, but I hope you have a wonderful Sunday.
you are muted. Thank you for that. Um, um, I just wanted to reiterate that Vaughn is very open to people reaching out to her if you'd like to be in conversation with her. So I want to introduce our next speaker now, um, Susan Honig, who is an ecological artist connecting earth and art to make visible the relationships between habitat, plant, and animal life. <clears throat> Her work with bird banding was pivotal in her knowledge of forest life, which is the focus of her cited leaf sculptures, um, which she will be sharing with us today. Susan's ambition is to arouse awareness and to re-envision ecological relationships and new possibilities for coexistence and sustainability. Um, so welcome, Susan. Thank you so much, Amara. Let me share my, okay. Okay. So in the book, um, my work about leaf sculptures um, is in a case study. And today I will take you on a walking tour. First, I wanted to welcome you to this area, this land of the Lenape, where I live in central New Jersey. So when I leave a walking tour, I put this sign, the sassafras sign I make by the road, and then people go down the road and by the parking lot, there's a kiosk with all the pictures of the different 11 leaf sculptures at Graber Woods preserve, preserved. And I put out a checklist for identifying the leaf sculptures for people on the walking tour or for the public to come because they're all along a um, trail, walking trail throughout this 95 acres of preserve. And um, so people sometimes come and walk and wonder what the stone sculptures are. They are all outlined the leaves are outlined below the trees thereof in different niches of this preserve. And I wanted people to see the relationship of the leaf to the tree and all these different, different areas of the forest. And on the walking tours, I talk about this. This is the red maple leaf sculpture and it's surrounded by a lot of Japanese stilt grass, which is an invasive grass, which is just taking over the understory of the forest. And you can see where I had to clear it around the stone, all the stone here. Here is a leaf sculpture of the black walnut leaf, leaflets made of river stone and it's surrounded by beautiful winter aconite flowers in the early spring along the trail. You can see the trail going by it there. And it's, it's quite beautiful. Winter aconite is invasive, but it doesn't seem to, um, it only comes up in this area beneath the, the um, gathering of the black walnut trees. Here is a, a picture of a walking tour I led in the autumn and I, I asked everybody to look up at all of the black walnuts on the trees. And you can see some had already fallen on the ground. And I love leading these walking tours for all different kinds of people, many of which have never even stepped foot in a forest preserve. So it's, I find it very important and to talk to everybody about what is happening and um, people often are really, really interested. Here you can see the black walnuts with a green hull around them. There are just so many that fall here. Every few years I make black walnut ink. I gather up a lot of these, these um, shells and let them soften. Here's a picture of the tulip poplar leaf sculpture, which is shown in the book. And um, you can see the walking trail goes right through the, the stem, people's footprints, even in the winter here. 
And in the fall, the tulip poplar leaves are just so, so beautiful. Here they are against the uh, tulip poplar tree trunk with beautiful lattice. The, the, the texture of the trunk, the bark is, is very beautiful. And the tulip poplar leaves are quite unique. They, they all have slightly different shapes. And here we are, we're walking through the um, trail, going through the spice bush into a deeper area of the forest. In the later summer, spice bush droops, berries come out and they are a very important food source for a lot of wildlife. And this is the sassafras leaf sculpture beneath the sassafras tree. And um, but behind the tree, I found this buckhorn antler and left it in place and showed it to everybody coming through on the leaf, on the walking tours. And you can see on the antlers how different um, animals gnaw on the um, antler and um, from rodents, mice, squirrels, opossums, um, even bear can gnaw on them. They get a lot of their minerals from, from gnawing on, on these antlers. I left it in place for about two years, and, but eventually it disappeared. And down the trail on this American beech tree, we're ent I'm entering the American beech grove now, you can see this, so I point this out. And this is what's called a buck rub. And um, the inner line is from an old wound, wound that is healing. And deer shed their antlers in the early fall and they rub their antlers against the trees to help um, rem remove them. It's very interesting marking. Here is the American beech leaf sculpture. Uh, the American beech is um, a very beautiful, um, beautiful tree. And um, it, um, it, there are many of them in this area. And there's a hilltop beyond. And there's a lot, there was a lot of glacial boulders there. And I took some of them to outline the um, lines of the leaf. You can see a lot of lichen on the stone. Um, and this is the picture of the American beach later on in the summer when I'm just so fascinated with these beach drops, which grow, sprout up, they, they, they grow and subsist on the American beach roots. And they, they, they're parasitic, but they, and they, but they lack chlorophyll, but they pop up and they have tiny flowers all around the, uh, the stone. It's quite a sight to behold. Only on the American beach roots, beach drops. So here is the black birch leaf sculpture. And the black birch tree was situated right in the middle of this leaf, leaf sculpture. After a few weeks, it fell. We had a big storm with high winds and this, the tree fell. And you can see here, I surmise that it fell because it was weakened by pileated, pileated woodpecker holes at the base of the tree, which weakened the tree. And a pileated woodpecker's favorite food are carpenter ants. And you can see here all the carpenter ant galleries that were at the base, looking into the, the bottom base of the tree after it fell. The galleries actually don't harm the tree, but the woodpecker holes um, did weaken it. So this is a group of Cub Scouts. And a family in my neighborhood asked me to lead a group and they called it Call of the Wild. And this is one of the stops at the Flowering Dogwood leaf sculpture along the Flowering Dogwood Trail. And um, it was really delightful to lead a group. I love to lead 
children, adults, all kinds of people. And here is the um, an autumn tour, walking tour of the Big Tooth Aspen leaf sculpture. You can see the points around the edges, the serrated edges of the leaf because the, the leaf is serrated. And so I had to find special stones that had points, river stones in a nearby quarry uh, to create this. And um, this is a stalk. You can see some of the, the leaves, they're yellow. They're really beautiful, beautiful colors in the fall. This is a big tooth aspen leaf. And I'd like to point out, I like everybody to hold and experience feeling the petuol, the, the stalk of the leaf, because it's flattened, which is perpendicular to the plane of the leaf. And that's what causes all the aspen trees, big tooth aspen, quaking aspen, to quake or tremble in the slightest breeze. Sometimes if there's a breeze, we stop and we listen to that beautiful sound. And you can see there's a leaf gall at the base of the leaf um, that's diagnostic of, of the big tooth aspen leaf. Often it's a moth which causes the gall. So they're beautiful, beautiful colors. Now this, we're moving on to a different um, place. This is the uh, Mountain Lakes Preserve in Princeton, New Jersey where I was an artist in resident at, during the summer of 220. And I was asked to collaborate to create leaf sculptures, one of which was this American chestnut leaf sculpture because they were doing a project where they were restoring the American chestnut in the, within the 18 acre restoration site. So, um, this is an aerial view where the top leaf goes beyond the deer exclosure fence and eight, eight um, saplings were planted. This is one and they are um, um, Native American, third generation blight resistant American chestnut saplings brought in here for this preserve. And uh, it, it's very important because the American chestnut tree was a very important tree up to 1930 when many of them died. And um, it provided a lot of food, the, the nuts, the chestnuts for many, many people and livestock animals. And um, they say, interestingly, that um, if a squirrel jumped through the canopy from Florida all the way up to Maine, they could jump all that way through the canopy of American chestnut trees. Just amazing, but they all died and people try and plant them. Apparently the, the, the percentage, of, the chance of them surviving is only 30%, even though they take great care of them here. So I'm really happy to, um, to do this project and collaborate with Friends of Princeton Open Space on restoring this this tree. And this is a, a picture of a sign there where a lot of people come. I also lead walking tours here. And it's based on a watercolor I did um, of the American chestnut. And um, they, people can read about it and read about the history. So that, that's, that's my, my talk. I hope you'll look at the book, the chapter, the case study of, of the leaf sculptures, because it has a few more details. It has a little more details about it, which I didn't go into in this shorter presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Susan. Thank you so much. If you stop, yeah, thank you. So let me introduce Lorraine. Uh, Dr. Lorraine Leeson is a visual artist who works through social engagement. She is known for her work with East London communities, including the Docklands Community Poster Project from the 1980s. She received the Regan Southwest 2016 Arts and Green Energy Award for her project, Active Energy, which she'll be talking about today. She's also the author of a book, Art Process Change, 
um, and is the first to focus on socially engaged art by a UK practitioner. Lorraine also teaches social practice at Middlesex uh, University. So I'm going to ask us to welcome Lorraine and uh, have her share her screen. Thank you, Amara. Um, and thank you to the organizers um, uh, for inviting me to this event and, and indeed to be part of this important publication. And just to say hello to some of my students um, my uh, an alumni from Middlesex. I, uh, lovely to see you here and to other colleagues who are here. Hi, David and Carolyn Carl. Um, so we were asked to um, introduce ourselves with a land acknowledgement. And um, I didn't put something in the chat because although, of course, I recognize the importance of this um, to, to many regions, it wouldn't be particularly relevant to London where going back to even 600 BC, that uh, even the incoming Celts were displacing other peoples. So I felt what would be more uh, relevant here would be to refer to something that was stated in one of the, um, uh, by one of the community organizers in, a, in the campaign over the London Docklands in the 1980s, um, where, which in fact we used one of our photo murals there. And he said, the people of Docklands have never owned the land, but they've lived on it, worked on it and died on it. It is their heritage and it should be their future. And I think that really sort of, um, you know, sums up in a way what East London is about. It's the industrial side of the city. It's where the docks were first built in the 18th century and where many incoming people have arrived at and settled. And it's also the poorest part of the capital where to the present day, people have had to engage in a, um, a constant struggle for survival. Uh, when I first came to this part of London in the 1970s, I was really impressed by the overlapping communities of political, social, cultural groupings and how organised these groups were, which is, of course, the legacy of, of this struggle. Um, and, but I felt it was somewhere that I could actually find a role for what I was looking for as an artist to use my skills to make a difference uh, and contribute to social change. So um, I learned through working with these communities um, of the expertise that is held at grassroots. And I, um, so I set out to enable what I feel that art is good at, which is to communicate, consolidate and celebrate these ideas and to make them visible in the public domain. Um, I'm gonna share my screen now uh, to talk to you about um, the Active Energy Project. Um, yeah. Um, so jumping forward several decades, in 2007, I was offered a small commission by Space Studios in East London to work with a group of older people in Bow. Um, it was to respond to recent research on the fact that the long-standing experience of seniors wasn't being taken into account in the development of new technologies. So through this, I was introduced to a group called the Geezers, self-named, I should say, um, who meet at an Age UK centre uh, to combat loneliness and isolation. And I asked them the question, what technology would you like to see developed that would benefit yourselves or your community? I had no idea what they would say. Uh, but after some discussion, one of them said, when older people can't afford to heat their homes and there's a tidal river down the road, the Thames that is, why aren't we using it to power our community? By the end of that first session, they all wanted to do it. They remembered, of course, several decades earlier, where it was very much in the news in the UK, all these different alternative forms of energy, um, tidal, uh, wave, as well as solar and wind. Because of course we are a group of islands crisscrossed by rivers. Um, you know, why are we not using water? Um, so what a good question. At the end of the session, I had to say to them, well, they all wanted to do it, uh, this subject. So I had to say, I know absolutely nothing about it, but what I will do is take you every step of the way that I can. So what we did is we started to research um, uh, what you need for tidal power, turbines, and then we discovered you need a barrage and that these can be uh, detrimental to the environment. But we also realised that actually London has a barrage. It has the Thames flood barrier, which goes right across the river. And nobody had ever thought of putting turbines on it. 
Um, so our, um, this commission ended in, it was only six weeks, it ended in a little exhibition. So uh, we sh did a, a visualization to show how you could use um, uh, turbines on the flood barrier to generate power for, for the capital. And I also um, did projections at this exhibition of the uh, large scale projections of some of the geezers because they had learned so much about this topic as well and were able to communicate it uh, to people in the community in the way that other sort of experts uh, failed to do. And this was at a time when climate change wasn't widely accepted. Um, so it was a fantastic project and it was amazing working with them, the energy uh, of these guys. Well, that, that was only a six weeks, it came to an end and they were still raring to go. Um, so I managed to raise a little tiny bit of money through comic relief, if anyone knows what that is, but it's a bit of a, a joke. <laughs> um, and I got them computerized um, so they could carry on their research. And meanwhile, I found some uh, engineers in the University of East London where I was based, um, and uh, they were really keen to work with us. So we carried on work developing ideas for tidal turbines. This person in the middle who you might see is not a ge one of the geezers. He's a uh, Professor um, uh, Stephen Dodds, who has in fact developed the, um, uh, the control system for the European Space Commission. Um, so he joined us and so did Toby Borland, this young engineer at the top who stayed with us on and off for the next 12 years. What I've discovered is when you do these sort of projects and they generate a flow of energy that actually people and resources come to you. So we started with nothing uh, and we were gradually, um, you know, going somewhere. But of course, I had to be quite resourceful in finding out how to, uh, you know, find resources where I could only raise small amounts of money. And so, um, but then the uh, space studios came back with a, a proposal for an intergenerational project and they raised some money um, so that the, um, the geezers were able to mentor underachieving boys at the school, uh, a project led by Tony, the engineer who had never worked in the school. Of course, I had worked in the school and there was a very good community engagement manager at, the, um, at Space. So it was like a, a boys project led by women. Um, and through this, they um, developed this uh, temporary turbine for the roof of the AGK centre where the geezers met, which spun round and generated power to spell out geezer power at night. And then another opportunity that came our way was um, a, a commission in Pittsburgh at the mattress factory. And um, I worked with a group of seniors there, Northside seniors, and introduced them to the geezers by Skype, as we didn't use Zoom then. But they had never used anything like it, nor had the geezers. It was a, a complete miracle getting them linked up and very, very exciting. Um, and they, uh, they egged each other on and then they, we did an exhibition, um, an installation at the Mattress Factory for the Feminist Sand Exhibition, curated by Henry Robinson. Um, and uh, that showed both of their, their projects. So we sort of carried on and, and with the geezers, we were by, by now we were going and giving talks about the project. They were fi really finding their voice and really um, they were the ones that drew in the crowds. It was, um, it was really lovely to behold. Um, we carried on and we tested the turbine that they'd developed um, in the Thames. Um, it was a, a small scale, very low cost, um, a very small amount of money I raised through national lottery funding. Um, but it turned out that, that there hadn't been another small scale, low cost turbine designed for slow moving tidal rivers. So something that uh, was discovered would be suitable for developing countries. And all the um, engineering uh, diagrams and everything were put on the uh, website so that they could be open source. Um, so another opportunity I seized was um, uh, that by then I was at um, Middlesex University where I am now. And there was um, a research project going on hydro citizenship, which was about the relationship of people to water. And we were able to work on a tidal tributary of the Thames, the River Lee. And through that, and with the um, uh, advice of uh, community and, uh, and environmental groups in the area, uh, Thames 21 particularly, we designed a, a floating water wheel that would rise and fall with the tide. And that drove um, an aerator to pump. Um, air into the water and keep oxygen levels high enough because at certain um, uh, certain uh, weather conditions 
uh, we, you would get sewage flooding into this river and the fish would die. But basically the sewage would use up the oxygen. So the aerator was unable to keep the, the fish alive during those periods of time. I'm glad to, I'm pleased to say there is a major sewer being built, but this was a temporary measure. And in the meantime, we put another, um, another one in the uh, Olympic Park um, and uh, ran another schools project. And we had uh, the Canal and River Trust introducing the environmental issues to the young people who also made their models of the turbines, which then they had an opportunity to show at a, an event that we showed, that uh, we held at the Olympic Park. And they were able to question the, um, the senior manager for climate change from the GLA, which is the Greater London Authority, the uh, regional government for London. So uh, he was asked to talk about the, uh, the GLA strategy for London and the young people and the older people both um, really um, put him on the spot and, uh, and challenged him to what was needed and put across their ideas, which I really hope helped particularly these young people find their voice. So that was, um, uh, that was the project. It was, um, in the end, it took, um, it was a 12-year project, um, which we did on and off with little bits of money here and there and, and then drawing on opportunities when we could. And I think um, what I would uh, like to end on is a quote that starts my chapter in, in ECOART, um, uh, and it's by an architect called, called Nabil Hamdi, who argues, argues for the power of small changes and how he says that intelligent practice builds on the collective wisdom of people and organisations on the ground which is then rationalized in ways that can make a difference globally. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lorraine. Thank you so much. So I guess we've reached the part of our program where we'll, we'll um, kind of bring this together. And then my understanding is we'll close this recording and open another one, which will focus on the Q&A. And Susan Steinman will be um, help will be leading that Q and A for us. You can direct your questions to um, uh, Susan 